So today's first panel, we're going to be talking about the basics of script to screen. And before we get started, I wanted to get kind of an idea of everybody in the room in terms of the types of budgets that you work with on your projects. Um, we're trying to, de to decide where we're going to be taking the conversation. So if we can have some volunteers just kind of talking about the, uh, the price ranges that your projects uh, are in, that would be helpful. All right, so well, I just wanted to say that the um, there was a recent call for feature films um, in Trinidad. This was last year, and those those three films just showed at the Cara Festa uh, festival that was held here in Trinidad, um, which is like a regional festival that happens every few years. Right there we go. Um, those films had a smaller budget. I think it was two hundred and fifty thousand TT. Yeah, TT. No, you, div you divide by seven. Okay, so yeah, divided by seven. <laughs> so what's the 35,000 US. 35 US okay. Yeah, so divided by seven to get US. So those each film was given 250,000. In the past, it has been a bit more, but I mean, because of the economy at the moment, we're a bit more restricted. So that's just to give you an idea now of sort of the, the situation and environment. I just want to say that um, I worked on one of the films, produced one of the films, and we raised additional funding. So what we are looking at is uh, maybe like a template where a film could be done to international standards for say half a million TT dollars. So divide by seven. So this is this is really helpful because um, you know for for those of the panelists that are all up here today, um, we have worked in the micro budget range. We consider this micro budget, but we've also worked on million US, which would be seven million TT. Look at that. Correct. Times seven. Um, so we'll touch briefly briefly on the higher level, like a seven million TT. But we're going to try and gear our conversations in the ranges that that we discussed. Um, so we'll, we'll kind of go from there. All right. So script to screen. It starts with the script. Every project, every per person in this room has an idea, has a um, desire to create a film based on a script. And I'm actually going to turn over to you, Chris, because in your life, you've read over, you've read over 60,000 scripts. So how do you identify the right script to, uh, to go into production? I'm looking at scripts specifically for talent. And somewhere along the line, you might need to attract talent. So uh, there's a general answer and then there are very, and then there <laughs> are specific answers in that I'm trying to find material that makes my clients happy. Uh, so for example, I might be reading a script where the character is a cop and at this particular place and time, the actor uh, that the script has been brought in for doesn't want to play a cop. So that script is out. So it can be that simple. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, I'm looking at stories that have universal themes that, uh, and for my needs specifically, deal with one character in particular, uh, where the story really revolves around that character, uh, first and foremost. So. For something like an ensemble piece, probably not uh, what I need. Denzel Washington doesn't really want to star in, as an, in an ensemble piece. He wants to be the star of the movie. Uh, and so specifically, I'm looking for roles where uh, the character has something to do, where the character changes. In fact, one of the first things that Denzel will always ask when I pitch him a script is he'll say, how does the character change? He always wants to know how the character is going to change from the beginning of the movie to the end of the movie because as the actor, that's what he's going to play. That's what intrigues him, is that transformation. So, uh, and that's just not something that I think one actor is interested in. I think a lot of actors are interested in that. And uh, you can go back to Aristotle and, you know, uh, if your story is important enough, your character will change because the story will affect change on the character. So uh, that is, I think, uh, a universal truth that I look for in scripts. I, I definitely agree. So you know, always thinking about you know, your strong protagonist and making sure that the stories that you do want to tell have a significant arc um, 
to uh, to finish the actual script. And um, as we start to talk about uh, getting them into production, you need to start thinking about other elements. And some of those other elements um, can be involved, things that make it attractive from a financing perspective. So can we talk a little bit, um, both RB and maybe Jean-Michel, um, from when you look for material, what does make it stand out um, to realize, hey, I can make this movie and, uh, and, and actually get it done? Well, I mean, we're talking about financing. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Um, when you're talking about financing, I, I look at it from two different, I come from two different perspectives. I'm a writer, but I'm also a producer. Sometimes the things that I write, I'm not producing. So I have to be sensitive to the budgetary, you know, restrictions of the film, uh, changing the story or changing locations, or, you know, if it's raining, you know, rain is expensive, getting rid of the rain. Same thing on, on a producing level, when we're doing a lower budget film, we just did a film, for example, uh, in Chicago, and it was 250,000 US. And um, originally, when we had budgeted out the movie, it came out to about 600,000. And we had to say, okay, we have 250,000, so how do, what do we do here? So things like, you know, there were a couple of scenes where characters were talking in cars, for example, we looked at that and said, okay, that's an expensive setup. It's a lot of time. It's, you know, you got to move your actors. You, it's, it's a lot. And we, we decided to cut the, most of those scenes out, or not cut them out, but we cut a couple of them out, but we moved a bunch of them to other locations where we were already shooting. It's the same conversation. It's the same drama. It's just not in a car. So, you know, you have to think, sometimes you have to think about those things, and you have to think about, what you can do to bring the budget down. A good producer will uh, look at a script and say, this is where we can nip and, and cut, you know, nip and tuck a little bit. This can be moved here. We already have a setup there. We only have our actors for a certain amount of days. So let's move all this to, to this part of the, you know, this part of the shoot. There's a number of different ways that you go about it to uh, try to cut it down and to be sensitive to it. But again, if you're writing, you have to be open to that. You know, it's for me as a writer, I do put my producer hat on even if I'm not producing that film. And I am sensitive to the fact that we only have this amount of money. And if they, you know, if the producers come to me or, you know, the director comes to me and says, look, we got to make some changes, I need to be open to that. You know, it's much more important to get the film made as opposed to being really precious about a particular scene, um, which is where the kill your darlings thing comes from, right? So. I was actually going to bring that up. So it, it has, have you guys heard of the expression, kill your darlings? Yeah. Okay. Um, for kill those of you who don't know what it baby. is, you know, it's hard because we, we're storytellers and we fall in love with the story that we're telling. And sometimes you have to kill your darlings in your script in order to be able to make it work. But back to Chris's point, you always need to make sure that you've got that strong protagonist. So you can't kill all the darlings. You just need to, to, to get rid of the ones that um, might hinder the actual production part of things. Um, so Jean-Michel, you've worked um, on the do in the documentary space and you've also worked in, in the feature space. Um, I'd love to get, get um, your take in terms of how um, the, the script development process um, and the production process happens for documentaries? No, I feel that um, the, the most important things. Can you guys hear him? No. no, okay. Hello? Yeah. yeah, okay. No, the most important things I should say, well, to start with, of course, is uh, uh, the passion that you have to uh, have personally for uh, what you want to uh, give to the world. And secondly, of course, it is the universality of uh, what you are doing. And I think the universality of uh, what uh, you are trying to express is even more important because we are in a tiny island. Trinidad and Tobago is 1.5 million. So that means that there is no market for uh, what we are do here. I mean, not market, which will be uh, monet monet monetizable in Trinidad. So whatever story that you are want to tell, and it can be a documentary or it can be a feature film, you have always to think, but what, what it will be for the, the, the French woman of 50 years old in Paris, the, 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 the guy in LA, uh, the guy. So, so you have to think, what, how can they relate? Mm -hmm. How can they find something that can be, uh, you know, changing their life or changing their thinking? So that is, I feel, the first, the first primary uh, uh, important point is uh, uh, you have to f always think about outside our island, because there is no market, there is no TV network who uh, will really buy or pre-buy your project. Now, 
the second matter, and I'm talking about experience, I, I don't think that you cannot do it without co-production. And this is what I was trying to, 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 to pass as a message. It's extremely difficult to do it by yourself. Uh, why? Because you don't have the network. Uh, I don't say that you don't have the expertise, but the, the, the network is extremely important. And I should say the, the other perspective of somebody else in the creative team is extremely important. The same stories see by, uh, I should say, a writer, which is Trinidadian, but a director, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, from a foreign country, can create exactly what we are trying to get is something which is understandable for outside or vice versa, sure. to have like a, a director which is local, but maybe a writer or a, somebody which will help the script, script writing to, to make it. Now, on the financial point of view, which is of course critical to make it happen, uh, I believe that we have a, a strong card in our end, and this is a card that everybody should play, is the rebate. Mm -hmm. Why the rebate is so important? Because if I am going to see a co-producer in a, a particular territories, I can practically say, even if I have no funding from here, that 35 to 40 percent of the production, according to what kind of team you have, can be reimbursed by the rebate system. Which means that uh, if you can get like a co-production partner, which has a door open to uh, my TV network who can pre-buy, pre pre or uh, uh, by now, of course, the Netflix and all this kind of uh, uh, company who can pre-buy with some funding also some on the specific country, like well, France, we have the CNC and all these kind of things. You build your budget with your 35% or 40%, it can make it happen, you see. So I feel this is the the, the, the card that we should play to uh, have other people and, 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 and other producers internationally coming on board, of course, if you have, of course, a strong script and a strong ID. Can it be for documentary, for docudrama, sure. which we did, or even, I think, feature film? So I believe yeah. that is uh, one of the key, you see. Definitely, and I think, um you know, one of the things that were, you know, to Jean-Michel's point about co-producing with other countries um, for the uh, the budgets that we've been talking about, um, you know, 35,000 U.S. to 85,000 U.S. Mm. dollars. Um, if, you know, sometimes if you have a bigger story to tell, um, you know, and we'll be teaching this while we're here, um, you know, just really to think about uh, partnering with another country so you can expand your budget. So that way you can go past your um, 35,000 to 85,000 that might duplicate it to perhaps maybe be in the hundreds of thousands and then maybe even to the million US dollar range so it, it, to Jean-Michel's point it's extremely important and then now Liz like you've worked literally in like almost every country in the world uh, which is amazing and can you talk can you talk a little bit uh, about um, you know projects that that you found from a directing perspective um, you know that have gotten you passionate and fired up to to want to be able to get that to screen well I mean it's what I really am also a professor and um, teach master classes globally and what I find is really fascinating is every country I was just in China for two months working um, I was in Italy six, you know two weeks ago working uh, and also working with international um, people it's everybody has a beautiful intrinsic authentic story from their country to tell and nowadays it is so important to be authentic to your voice and to your country. And people are really looking for that. They're really interested um, in promoting whatever country, I had a, met a filmmaker from Egypt. You know, there's, there's fascinating stories. And those, what makes those stories work so well is what we're talking about is you have these um, authentic stories from the specific country, say we have in Trinidad, but the themes are global, the themes of love, the themes of war, the themes of compassion, or what, whatever it is that turns you on, is a global thing. It is, it is a global filmmaking community. And I think that's why Amanda is talking to, the, the biggest thing now is, is to use the co-producing, is to join with other countries. When I was in China, I started creating a project that I want to do in Hong Kong. And I realized if I do it in Hong Kong, you can only do it in, with China in certain um, time areas you can actually do Hong Kong history. 
Otherwise, you're not allowed to do those films. But say for Hong Kong, if you do a Hong Kong film in the 80, from the 80s, you can get all this international cast because it was an international city. From that international cast, I can get multiple countries to invest into that film. So it is using what I think we're talking about here is the, from the ground of the idea is how can I be clever enough to get this film not only made, but make a film that makes a statement and gets it out of the myopic of it's just a small story in Trinidad just for the Trinidad audience. Um, and so that's what I've seen. I think people are very excited about because it is, as a, a commercial director, I've worked globally. So I'm in Russia doing Dove. I'm in somewhere else doing Colgate. But it, it doesn't really matter anymore. It doesn't really matter. It, it, there's huge conglomerates um, that, that are in every, every country. You have you know, Kentucky Fried Chicken here. So filmmaking needs to sort of follow that path. And what I, the most advice I can give you is, is also in the creative way is, is, you know, that's why Madonna was so successful. She sung about what she knew. <laughs> she did not sing about being like a nuclear engineer. Um, she said, you know, so it's important to, and people want those specific detailed stories that makes people really, you know, it, it, it is a worldwide audience as I was, um, when I was uh, teaching over in China last year, the, f the favorite film of the 19, 20 year olds was Call Me By Your Name, which is a gay love story, which in China, that was their favorite film across the board. And so it's a, it is, if you make a film that really has, addresses things that you think are important to your culture um, and get some other people to join in to do that, it can have a huge global reach. Definitely agree. And, and, you know, now more than ever, the global reach is within your hands. And, um, you know, but it, just by virtue of, of stage 32 and, and the platform, um, you know, we have over 500,000 creatives from all over the world that are on the platform that you can connect with instantly. So to everybody's point, um, you know, it starts with, you know, with Chris loving a character, falling in love with the character, seeing a strong arc, um, figuring out how to get it produced um, on a budget that makes sense, having universal themes, but on a global scale, and maybe looking at different uh, countries that you can partner with to increase your budget. I mean, you really can start to think outside of just Trinidad, which is incredible. And that's the, the world that we, we live in today. Um, I want to, yeah, sure. Two things that were just mentioned that you guys mentioned that I think we don't want to gloss over, the power of relationships and the importance of finding your tribe. This is a tribal business. You know, you want to work with the same people over and over again. It makes it easier. You end up developing a shorthand and you don't realize that on a global scale, you know, again, it, there's no excuses now not to be making connections every single day and not working on your relationships every single day because you can do it online. You could do it online standing, you know, waiting to get coffee, you know, you could do it online, you know, you could do it while you're on the bus or, you know, not in your car or if you're in traffic, what the hell, uh, I didn't say that. But you can do it, there's no excuses not to do it. And then the universal story, you know, part of that is everybody in this room has a story they want to tell. What makes yours different? Um, what makes yours stand out? There's a saying, a couple of sayings that we hear in LA all the time in this business, which is, We've seen this before, what makes it different? Or sometimes you'll hear, you know, it's been done. You know, is there another angle in? Like, what's what's the angle in? So, you know, finding that love story, you know, like you're talking about Call Me By Your Name, it's a gay love story, but it, it's kind of a twist on what's been done before. Um, you know, you have to find what that angle is. If you have a love story, again, is it, is it specific to the culture? Is it something that, you know, you've heard a story you heard before that you want to elaborate on but what makes it different and i think the combination of those things finding your voice because everybody's looking for that unique voice and that does make it different you know you could be telling a story that's been told a thousand times before but you're coming at it from a very unique perspective and a unique voice that's that's great but then how do you get it done and you get it done by having you know your tribe and and your relationships and your people that end up uh, becoming champions of you, you know, and it usually starts with them becoming champions of your work. You first, like if you make something small, they become champions of that, 
and then they become champions of you. And then once they become champions of you, then you're off to the races. I totally agree. And um, can you guys give some advice? So let's say, um, you know, they've identified a story. Um, miraculously, it was funded. Let's all just imagine we have a magic bank that's funding these stories we're telling. Um, can you guys give some advice when you start to go into pre-production? How to best handle pre-production? Plan. <laughs> Every, everything about pre-production is planning. The, 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 uh, the better better pre-planning that you've done, then you have more room, I think, to uh, adapt to a lot of the snafus that happen during production. But uh, yeah, to me, it's all, it's all about pre-planning, really, really thinking ahead and lining all your ducks up in a row. And it's about honesty. It's about being honest with yourself. You know, what is, you know, what's the true budget? Being honest about that, being honest about the amount of shooting days, being honest about the people you're working with. Are these the people you really want to go to war with and be, you know, with 18 hours a day? Um, are the actors people that you really want to work with? Are they going to be trouble on your set? You need to be honest about all these things at the beginning. The more things that, you know, the, the more that you can tackle the truth in pre production, the less issues you're going to have during production. And, you know, I'll, I see a lot of people say, you know, in pre-production, like, ah, you know, well, we could deal with that actor or, you know, yeah, he's a pain in the ass, but, you know, we, you know, we could deal with that or, yeah, we can cut a corner here and then all of a sudden you get halfway through and the actor's locking themselves in the bathroom that actually happened uh, and not coming on set for the entire day and yet you're losing the entire day and your money's going down the drain. I've seen people say, well, we could, nah, it's fine, we could shoot this outdoor scene and whatever and then that day comes it's the only day they've scheduled for it and it rains all day and you know it's it's just being honest and being prepared now liz can you give some like specific examples because you've gotten ready for millions of shoots so can you give some specific examples like how many meetings should you have what you know how far in advance should you be planning what you know what should be top of mind well, for, as, as for the lead creative if, it, if it's the lead creative and you're not answering to the money the money people are, you know, you're answering to, um, you know, uh, they always say God has a girlfriend and, you know, he, she needs to be cast in the film. So if you're not answering to something, then you as the creative opt to look at whatever that project is. Is it a TV show you're directing? Is it a commercial director? What are the things that are most important to you to get? You can't, everything's not going to be at 100%. You can't every day, you can't give 100% to every scene, every setup, everything. And some things are gonna, you only have time to do, you know, one walk and talk. We don't have time to do a turnaround. We don't have time to do this and that. So the biggest critical thing I see with younger filmmakers, or not say younger filmmakers, but with, you know, those gaining experience, is they think that every, every bit of that pie is critical. And it's not, it isn't. You have to think about what is, A, there's two ways to look at it. What's critical to tell that story, whether it's a 30 second story or two hour movie. And at the same time, what is critical basically to your reel. In that show, you have to be a mercenary sometimes because it, it is your, your work you're showing. You're gonna be hired on the basis of what your work looks like. So as, as a creative, that's, that's your, you, you look at the two different layers. One is what, what do I need, what am I hired to deliver? Here, even if it's your, you know, you're hiring yourself. Let's say it's your own project. You raise the money, blah blah. And and what will also be, you know, have the cool factor, basically now, because everybody's sort of, you know, and you need to have something that you can cut down and have that 30 second thing, and that looks great. And and that's where you then you figure out your schedule. That's where you're going to spend your time. That's where you want the extra toys. That's where when you get into the bigger, you want the Ronin. You know, that's where we're going to do different types of um, imagistic manipulations. That's where I want to put my CG budget into because it can't, you can't just spread it all across because you just have a big mush at the end. Um, the main thing is, as, um, is to realize when you're a director is that every department is like you're, it, it, I come from being an athlete. I was in sports my whole life growing up, so I l really look at it as an athletic event. And each, each head of department, whether it's the wardrobe or the, um, the glam squad or 
any of them. They each are, are like my team members, they're, and, they're, and they're the directors of their own departments. So there's a lot of respect level that needs to happen. It's not topped the way, um, as we're going more and more, we're, we're moving more into this open frame culture you know, across the board right now. We're not, this is how, what like coding is about, this is what all the gamers are doing, they're sharing information. It's a much more um, equal playing field, but with a vision. The top down, if, you, if you're just barking orders, you're not gonna get the same amount of um, follow through interest and, and, and they won't go the extra mile. But if you treat them all as equals and you treat them as they have the precision of each of their departments, you know, the DP is obvious, but, but um, you know, the grip department, the key grip in that, you treat that as an, like, that's a, you know, a master engineer. That guy knows how to get that camera girl up on that scaffolding, which I wouldn't know how to do. And so you, you, you create a, a team, like a sports team, and you, you hear what their feedback is and then you go out and play the game. And, and, and t definitely, and it's like, it's a trust. It's all comes down to trust and communication with your tribe. Um, I'd love to get, though, back to, to the nitty gritty in terms of the actual planning before you shoot. Um, how, you know, in, based on any of your experiences prepping for movies, how often should you be meeting with your key team members before you get to that first day on set? And what should be happening um, in those meetings as you're prepping to go on set? I mean, the film we did in Chicago recently, the writer and the director met a ton. Um, they talked through a lot. Uh, the producers would come in after those meetings, and we would talk about where do we want to really focus on. Like, you know, we have this amount of shooting days. Obviously, we had the schedule. We had everything budgeted out. But we said, okay, w you know, let's look at every, each day and decide, you know, if what can we lose like what matters the most what's going to be on the screen that is going to affect the audience in the greatest way and those are the let's let's check those off and make sure that we're going to have plenty of time to get the walk and talk so the over the shoulders or the whatever we want to put it on a dolly and it's going to take you know hours to set up and we're going to you know all that and and we really it helped enormously and we did that probably I mean, four or five days in a row before we shot. And then what we would do is every morning, if we had like a 6.30 call time or whatever, we would get there at like 5.30. And we'd sit again for that day and go through everything. And, you know, we'd sit with the director. The writer was on set because she was a producer and we wanted her on set. Um, the DP, you know, the grip. And we would talk about it and we would say, okay, and then the DP would say, well, you know, we're shooting in a tight spot. We got to reverse the world here. We really didn't think about that. What if we do this? And we were shooting across, the, the story was told across 20 years. So there were times where, for example, we knew we had one setup and instead of flipping the world to, you know, get the reverse, if we had the same, like in the same day, if we had the characters in 1995 and then 2015, instead of flipping the world, we would stay in the same spot and just change the clothes and change the hair. And we'd spend the hour in makeup instead of spending the three hours flipping and flipping back and everything like that. But that took a lot of planning. I mean, a lot of planning. So about five or six days straight and then every morning, at least now. And then usually during lunch too. Usually during lunch, we would sit down again and say, okay, where are we at? You know, we're halfway through the day. What are, you know, what's going on? And if we're going to lose anything, where can we move it later? And you know all that. So yeah, I love and I love that you had the writer on set too, because it ultimately always goes back to story, and mm -hmm. and that yeah. really you know and on the fly, you know, you might be faced with circumstances like um, you know a street gets cut off and you can't use it for your scene, or it starts raining, and then it really ultimately has to come down to story. And well, we had many conversations, for example, like halfway through a day when we were running late. We would go to the writer and say, especially as we were getting late in the shoot and we were running out of days, we would go to the writer and say, okay, the, out of these three scenes being shot over the next six days, if you had to lose one, in your opinion, which is the one that wouldn't impact the story? Or that maybe we can move, if there's an important piece of dialogue in that one scene, can we move it someplace else? Or, you know, get the same impact with a look or a prop or whatever the heck it needs to be. But we may have to lose one of these three scenes. And then the writer would go off 
and you know come back a half hour later and say I think this is the one you know this and you know and then you try your best to get it in you budget it for it but it doesn't always work out that way but that's the flexibility you need that's the communication you need that's the, most bad most films fall apart with a lack of communication my lack of pairing and then a lack of communication while you're on set Jean-Michel, do you have anything to yes, add? I mean, I can talk about, I mean, the specific of Trinidad and Tobago, yeah. since, I mean, uh, producers, all my film in Trinidad and Tobago, yeah. well, it's clear that uh, at pre-production, the first the two main things is, one is, you have to be pessimistic. I mean, when I say that you have to be pessimistic is you have always to think about the worst scenario. And I mean, uh, we, we have film in difficult conditions, which, for example, Carnival Time, Or if you you know if you imagine the traffic, if we imagine the confusion, etc., how it can be. So you have really to anticipate these kind of things, and uh, I mean go really into detail. I mean uh, say something, but always the same thing. But uh, if the maxi taxi guy do not come in time, it's finished. So I mean uh, it's a, he's the most important guy that day. I mean I'm just to giving you a caricature, but yeah. uh, in Trinidad it's critically important. So I mean. Uh, Oh, we, we hopefully have here a, 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 a very strong professional dedicated and uh, actually in time. <laughs> so uh, that come to my second point is a, is a team. I mean, it's I believe it's very difficult to do a movie without with a team that you don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to know very well, yeah. as I say, from the maxi taxi guy to the to the top guy. Now, in our specific uh, experience. It's clear also that we try to do a balance between uh, uh, outside input and local input. So sometimes, for example, I mean, a first AD, if uh, there is a, a feature film, we suggest to get it from outside. So he can come maybe with his second AD. Uh, but the role of the, uh, of the, of course, artistic um, location, etc., is also extremely important. So you have to make a mix of local people and foreign people. And of course, if you have a rebate, This is an every important point because uh, it's only the local people which are eligible for a rebate. So you have to really uh, try to, to mix the balance the two. And as I say, uh, the, 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 the pe knowing people is critical. I mean, try to working with people that you already work is, is, a, is really, really important. And it's, it's, it's a, in Trinidad and Tobago, it's quite easy because there is not too many people actually which are, if you do a, I should say a feature film and you need a full team. I mean, you come back to always more or less to the same people. So, I mean, uh, it's important to, 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 to not try to take risk and, uh, you know, uh, yeah. to, go, to go beyond. After that, on the point, of course, of, uh, uh, I should say, uh, uh, being able to work with the flow and be re being able to, 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 to mitigate, I find this super important. It's, you know, I mean, you have... Uh, Also the weather, you see, you know, I mean, the, the weather can, except if you shoot at the dry season, mm -hmm. which is right. like uh, for sure that you don't have rain the rest of the year. It's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's um, it's an unknown, uh, 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 I should say, scenario. I mean, you can control it by choosing specific time, but sometimes you you can't. And I should say also that. Uh, I mean, in the relationship between producer, director, and the entire team, it's true also that uh, young director you mentioned, I mean, they come, they want everything you see, and uh, you have also there to mitigate. I mean, I gave always the example that they will ask you to build a house, and you can build just a door and a window, you see. Yeah. So the, again, that is a team who can, uh, especially the, 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 the director, uh, artistic director, which can... Uh, which can uh, be good enough and strong enough to make his point and uh, make you save quite a lot of money. So, I mean, all this point is, uh, I believe, what you mentioned also. So, um, just think it about the specific of Trinidad for weather, for sure. uh, carnival days, if you are filming uh, at that time. Outside, yeah, yeah, take a lot of room, you know, uh, for uh, transport and things like that. And okay. uh, as a very strong team, uh, with trying to go into as many detail as possible. That, uh, And definitely communication is key. Um, I want to uh, leave some time to open it up for questions, but before I do, um, do you guys, I want, I'd love for you guys to share a resource um, that uh, when people are like, To, are, when people are trying to decide on, um, you know, what story they do want to put onto the screen, can you give one resource um, for them that has helped you? <clears throat> Just two things. One is uh, just I know what you're sort of going for with the meaning. So basically, 
with, when you're when you're doing your meetings, you have your big sort of brouhaha crew meeting at first, and then you have breakout meetings with the director, the producer, and the heads of each department. You don't not monopolize the time of everybody when you're starting out. You want to talk, you know, to the DP. So it's the, the producer is always there because. The director is is their job is to vision it off the page and and how are we going to shoot it? What is the what what is this going to look like? It could look there's many different ways you could go, but the producer needs to be there as the money counter, being like, oh we can't afford that, oh we can't afford that. So the director is not necessarily having these private conversations with heads of departments, but they go to each department head and they start talking what's the vision of the wardrobe in the 1980s, what's the vision of the wardrobe when it's in the 1920s and. And so then each head of department goes and starts creating their thing and they come back and there's a whole back and forth, um, not only with the whole team, but with the very specific needs of the vision of how the shoot is going to look and, and what's the style and what we're going for and basically what we can afford. Um, <clears throat> creatively, there's a great resource on, uh, it's uh, called the DGA.org, the Directors Guild of America, and it's they record all their and it's public. You can listen to it. They record all their um, basically big screenings that they have. So uh, uh, I just listened to Paul Thomas Anderson interviewing Quentin Tarantino, right. and um, so just go to DGA.org and look for. Um, I think it's like. I don't know what it's under, recordings or something like that, but you can always access that. And they have amazing, it's just like every amazing director that you would ever want to hear speak, speaking. Any other resources? Uh, well, you know, you can always look at the trades. Yeah. Obviously, you know, The Hollywood Reporter, Variety, Deadline, uh, they will at least keep you in touch with sort of who the players are globally and what projects are uh, are in the works or actually in production? Uh, I have a Facebook page. If anybody's on Facebook, it's a it's a writers group. Uh, it's not, of course, as uh, extensive as Stage Thirty Two, <laughs> but uh, it's called the Inside Pitch. So if you're on Facebook, just look it up. And uh, if it asks you how you found out about the, the group, just say. Trinidad. <laughs> uh, I will uh, pimp my own. Yeah, stage yeah. 32. I mean, I mean, stage 32, the thing about it is you can go to the stage 32 blog, for example, which is stage32.com backslash blog. There's over 1,500 blogs uh, that have been published. They're written by people such as this that are in the industry and doing it right now. Um, the stage 32 lounge, which is our version of uh, filmmaking, but like our version of filmmaking forms. So there is an acting lounge, a screenwriting lounge, a filmmaking lounge, a production lounge. You can go in there, and there's over 120,000 threads that have been started that you'll be able to go through, and you know you can contribute. You can ask questions. But there's a whole lot in there about pre-production, and then I think everybody's getting four free webinars. Yeah. You guys are going to be getting four free webinars for Stage 32. There are a bunch on pre-production. Mm -hmm. I'll be switching this one out. Yeah, yeah. Some feedback. Yeah. Am I getting feedback? Yeah. We can switch out in between probably, right? Is it like Aquaman? Yes. Aquaman. But anyway, you're going to get four free webinars. There's a bunch of them on pre-production. And uh, I would highly recommend those. You might be able to even suggest which one. Yeah. yeah. Jean-Michel, can you recommend any resources? I mean, I believe that uh, I would say that I cannot really recommend any resources. I have no blog or no uh, personal uh, Facebook, etc. But I mean, uh, good resources, I should say for Trinidad, is of course the website of uh, Fintiti. Because, I mean, you have all this information about rebate, all this information about also uh, provider. So I believe that if somebody wants to do uh, work in Trinidad, uh, they can first have uh, the Fintiti website Love as a first uh, point of entry. And Go. Love it. Um, all right, guys, I want to open it up for questions. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I have a question for Christopher. Yes. It's about script analysis. Um, 
from your bio it says that you curate scripts for actors like so you're looking for work that's just a fancy bio word. Yeah, yeah okay it's yeah. nice but anyway nice word um do you for those of us who may not be very experienced with script analysis um are you uh, very experienced in that or is your work more in terms of curating scripts and finding scripts and stories for actors do you do you work in, in script analysis yeah, now it goes very much hand in hand yes. right so okay so i am analyzing material uh i'm giving notes i'm communicating what the script is about to many people right uh, to agents to talent um yeah it's it's actually it's really all script analysis right Okay. Um, do you can you give some advice or tips for those of us who are just trying to learn more about um, you know that part of the process, uh, script analysis in terms of you know whether you are the writer who wrote the story or you're the producer who's coming in and you're going to be working in script analysis with your director and your actors. Um, can you give advice on the process of script analysis? I, I mean, just starting from you know from the development phase. So as you're going into pre pro. The first thing that I will say is that when I look at a script, I really look at it holistically. So I'm really, I'm not the guy that reads the first 10 pages and claims that I know if a, if a script works or not based on the first 10 pages. I, I don't buy that at all. Because I have read scripts where the first 10 pages are not very good, but the other 110 pages are great, and then you just go back and you fix the first 10 pages. Right. Um, if I passed on scripts that I thought didn't work based on early pages, I would have passed on A Beautiful Mind, which got Russell Crowe an Oscar nomination because I thought the first 40 pages of that script were incredibly dull. Or Gosford Park, which won the Academy Award for Best Screenplay, I thought the first 50 pages of that were incredibly dull. Um, but eventually it sort of all coalesces and then things work. And so I always look at material holistically. I don't judge things based on bits and pieces because everything can be fixed. Uh, so, and that actually took time, uh, you know, uh, because in the beginning I would be very nitpicky and you know, say, oh, well, the dialogue doesn't work, or there's a misspelling on page five. I don't give a crap about any of that stuff because misspellings on the page do not translate on the screen. Yeah. You know, you can't see misspellings on the screen. None of that matters. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is a good story. That's what matters. And so that's what has to come up from the page. So going back to what I said earlier, for me, it really starts with the character and what it is the character wants. So really, what is this character's goal? What is his intention? What is the purpose of the story from the character's point of view? So from the most base uh, example, in The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy wants to go home, right? She ends up in some place that she doesn't want to be and she wants to go home. And through that whole movie, she's struggling to get home and there's all these obstacles. And so just from a very basic point of view, that's what I'm looking at. Because by giving this character a goal, then you can actually create character. Because cat in, in, in drama, from my point, you build the character based on the choices the character makes in his or her journey to reach that goal. Right? That's what makes a character. The choice is the character. So if you're walking down the street and you see a wallet and it's filled with hundred dollar bills, the choice that you make in regards to what you do with that wallet determines who you are. If you pick up that wallet, you open it up, it's all cash, no ID, and you take it to the police station to return it, that's one character. If you pick up the wallet, take the cash, and throw it back on the ground, that's another character. If you decide to take half the cash and leave the other half, that's another character. So the choices the character makes is what creates character. In drama, character's not backstory and psychology so much. It's about what the character does. In relation to trying to achieve that goal that you establish, typically by the end of the first act. So those are just some sort of basic structural things that I look for. Because often if you don't give a character anything to do, 
and a lot of scripts I read, characters don't have anything to do, then you have no drama because there's no conflict and you really can't create a character. Not in a dramatic sense. Right. So you look at it, you're looking at the script holistically first and then going more into the process of Absolutely. sequences, scenes. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on a, on, um, a point you made earlier about building your tribe and the importance of networking, of course, in this uh, digital age. And um, I've reached out to some individuals online and you know, get, you gauge conversation, you, you know, they, 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 they speak to you, but is there a way that you could plug a project or, you know, a way that stealthily or, or do you wait till you meet them at a conference? Just see your um, thoughts on it. My whole thing is, you know, we're going to have an actual panel on this. So we're going to get really deep into best approaches and crowdsourcing and everything. I wrote a book called Crowdsourcing for Filmmakers and crowdsourcing is very different than crowdfunding. It's about building an audience and building your tribe building champions of you, your brand, the brand of you, the brand of your projects, and so on. It is a long game. It's a marathon and not a sprint. I always say to people, think about the best friendships you have in your life. How long did it take for you to build that trust and to really build that friendship? It starts, you know, on a micro level and it builds, right? Everything begins with, with relationship building, everything begins from a point of selflessness. And this is the mistake that most people make online is they go on social media and everybody gets handed a microphone and everybody starts yelling into that microphone about how great they are, how wonderful they are. Look at me, look at me, donate to my, look, watch my, and everything like that. It, all it does is create this cacophony of noise. It's just noise. White it ends noise. Up, it's white noise. white noise. And what ends up happening is everybody tunes out. But if you come from a place of selflessness, and I have a rule of three, well, again, we're gonna get into this a lot more, but my rule of three is I always give three times before asking for anything. And usually it's a lot more than three. But people don't realize that it's a human connection. It's social media, right? It's, it's a human connection that you're seeking. Everybody is looking to do, everybody in this life has a goal, you know, everybody. And everybody in this business has a goal and sometimes multiple goals. So how do you help each other and how do you facilitate it? And how do you come from a place of a collaborative spirit as opposed to sort of a selfish spirit? And so my, the answer to your question is absolutely you can approach them online and you don't have to wait to be face to face. And the reality is if you build that relationship, you can get to a point where you say, hey, how about we, stop, we hop on a Skype call and you know see each other and meet each other and talk about what we're doing and everything like that. But you have to go in for the long game and you have to buy into the long game. And one other thing I'll say, even though we're gonna get into this, like I said in the, in the other panel, I know there's probably, how many people in this room would identi identify uh, as, as introverts? Uh, introverted, okay. That's why you weren't asking questions. Yeah, and that's and that is why, and that is why, and I get that. I'm, you know, I may seem very extroverted on, on the surface, you get me into, you pull me into a conversation, you pull me into a group, and I will be the life of it. You ask me to start put pulling people into a group, it's tough for me. It took me a long time to get there. You have to break out of that. And I'm, you guys are gonna start today, okay? I'm gonna give you three ways to break through being an introvert online and social media right now. And again, even though we're gonna get into this, I know I'm giving away the whole panel, but. Really, I mean, it's, and again, these, think about how these are giving, right? You read a great piece of material. You guys, hopefully, like Chris said, are reading the trades every day, and you're obviously doing research for your projects and reading articles and blogs. You find something that blows you away, share it on social media. You're giving to people, okay? Somebody posts a great piece of material, and you sit there and you go, wow, that was amazing. Tell them that was amazing. Thank them for sharing it. Tell them you're gonna pay it forward and share it with your followers and your community. And the final thing, which is very, very simple, is ask questions. It's very simple. You know, what's your project about? What are you doing? I mean, these are the ways that you break through. But always remember it's a long game, okay? Building relationships take time. Building trust takes time. And especially when you're creating, you know, when you're, you, you wanna know that you're, you're sharing that sort of symbiotic uh, collaborative thing that allows you to push something forward. And you know, a asking questions here. So it's like a year from now, this woman can reach out to me and say, hey, we met 
in Trinidad, I was the woman who asked the question about script analysis. I'm going to remember her. You, the guy in the back. Yeah, I sat in the back and didn't raise my hand. Yeah, that's a delete probably. Sorry, but it's the truth. Because you didn't make any kind of personal connection with me. You know, I get a hundred emails a day asking for favors. You know, I got to go with who I know. And so this is an opportunity. You have people here from all around the world who you're probably never going to see again. And yet you have the ability to make a personal connection with yes. us. So being an introvert, put your hand on, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> um, this, this is, this so is, you to remember, you I sure am. <laughs> this is, you know, this is the time for you to, uh, to make a connection. You know, everybody complains about social media. Well, here, you know, this is the real, the real deal, the old fashioned way. So reach out, touch us. Uh, so um, I'm Joanne Butcher. I'm a business coach for filmmakers, and I mostly work in the micro budget space. Most of my clients are making their first feature. However, I have some clients who are I call them pure writers. You know, they're not they're not like I want to make a movie. They want to write. So um, I'm obsessed with you know what's the first step, what's the second step. You know, so. For a writer who has not had a film made yet, you know, what would be a next step and what would be the steps to get to William Morris, for example? You know, what, what might those pieces be? Well, I, I think for uh, a new writer trying to get a little bit of heat uh, on her would be helpful. That might mean entering various contests or fellowships I'm sure Stage 32, Stage 32 does have a contest actually. And um, this is a way perhaps to sort of help to float to the top a little bit. You wanna be very careful about contests though. So you really wanna vet them uh, and make sure that they do what they say they do. Uh, often a cash prize is not necessarily the best thing, but sometimes it might be. So, um, and then uh, also trying f uh, to look for management. First, and we have some managers here, and they'll be addressing those issues. Uh, rather than going for an agency first, rather than going for somebody like William Morris first, going for perhaps something that's a little smaller. WME represents the top 7% of the industry. So if you're not Martin Scorsese, you're not you know, Aaron Sorkin, then you're probably not gonna get in just yet, unless you're really hot, like unless you just came off Sundance and everybody's talking about you. Uh, or you win the Nickel Fellowship. If you're a screenwriter and you don't know what the Nickel is, you should certainly investigate that. Um, but there are many, many great places where new writers can start and grow, and then when they become part of that top 7%, they often leave their other places, or we just steal them, mm. and, you know, <laughs> and, and they come. The step up to competition? Management. management would be management, right? Absolutely. Just you know, to piggyback on that, it's a two, to me, it's a two pronged attack. When I didn't have representation, and I was anxiously seeking it as a writer, it was entering contests, but it was only entering contests that gave me access, and only spending money on things that gave me access, including conferences. Like you know, I, I would only go to a conference or a you know a pitch thing, or if I had direct access with decision makers. Contest the same way. In fact, the way I actually got to my first manager was I won a contest that gave me access to people in the business that led to it, my script being passed to this manager and me getting rep by that manager. So that was the first way. The second way is absolutely relationships. You just said you get a hundred script, you get a hundred emails a day. Man I was exaggerating, but it, no. But most man, I lied. All right, I lied. I just wanted to sound impressive. Most managers do though get a hundred get a hundred emails a day. And, you know, they got to pick and choose. And, and, you know, they have their own clients, right? We, we are, this is a story we hear all the time. We talk to managers. Managers will say, look, I have three piles of scripts on my desk, right? My clients, so I got to read those, right? People that have been referred to me by other people I know, so people who have won champions, and those champions have said to that manager, you need to read this work, and everything else. Mm -hmm. And a lot of managers, managers will say, I never touch any everything. I just can't get to it. 
you know, it takes two hours to read a script, an hour and a half to read a script, they can't get there. So to me, it's about what get, if you're gonna, if you're gonna pay for something, does it give you access? And then everything else is building relationships and winning those champions. By the way, winning champions, your fellow writers, because you never know when one of your writer, when your, your writer friends may get signed and they may say, gotta take a look at your script as well. It's great, I have a writer. No connection is a bad connection. That's why you gotta be out there making them. It, it matters, make, make friends with directors, producers, everybody, you should never know. But those are the two avenues in my opinion. Also, all the all the networks now have writing fellowships. NBC, NBC, uh, see, Warner they, Brothers. They all have writing fellowships. Because and I've been in a bunch of the directing fellowships, and that just it just more sits you in the conversation of the industry, basically. Um, and as he said, I came to my manager through another director referring me to that manager. So it wasn't like, I didn't solicit it. It, it. Sometimes what I find is you not necessarily, your management and will come to you when it's the right time. It's not necessarily, if it's not coming to you currently, it might not be the right time in your trajectory. And as, as RB was saying, it is a long game. It's a long game and you just want to play your cards smartly. May I just add one thing, which is that uh, in, this, uh, in the States right now, diversity is a really big buzzword. And so there are a lot of contests and fellowships that are looking for diversity. So if uh, you are a woman or if you are a person of color, right now in our town where we are, it's never been better. Never been better. Ew. My name is Navi Lancaster. I, yes, that's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Kiss ass. I know. I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll do some more. Proud member of Stage City 2 since 2011. Wow, so, you're yeah. one of the beginners. Yeah. You're, yeah. yeah. you're smart. You're smart. <laughs> wow. Um, two things. One is a question, and two is a perfect example of what you're talking about, the long game. So I'll explain the long game one first, because that one was actually quite recent. Um, it was through, uh, through LinkedIn, right? Uh, I met a film financier who came to Trinidad actually about seven years ago or something like that, kept in contact with him. So through my usual networking, because I'm a, I'm a really big fan of networking through social networks, and I ran into a lady who said that she was a, basically a film producer and she's looking for a film financer. I said, cool, hooked her up with this guy and now they're in talks, you know? Mm -hmm. So basically it's a, a case of make sure that, that even though you have a network, keep in contact with people, right? All the time, because yeah. you never know when you might need them, right? That's the first thing. Second thing is dealing with what Mr. Water was talking about in terms of uh, putting stuff out there and getting your name out there. Uh, one example, which I want to bring in, it comes with a question, uh, and something I, I hope that you elaborate in the panel coming, is putting out your own content in terms of how to, how to do things. Um, for people who follow me online, they would know that every so often, even on Instagram, on my LinkedIn, on other networks, um, every time I do a project and on my own website, I do how to's of how to do certain things. So for example, like I did a sound design and the intro music for a music video. I did three blogs on it. How to, what the sound design was, why it was created, that kind of thing. And um, now I'm seen as a quote unquote expert in certain aspects of post-production. So I would like the panel to elaborate the importance of uh, putting your work out there as a, as a how to, how to do things. Because I'm a firm believer in there are no secrets anymore. You know, the um, knowledge is ubiquitous, mm -hmm. but it's just a matter of telling people what to do and your experience in the process. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, thank you for that. That was awesome and mm -hmm. great to meet you in person, finally. Yes, that's right. And I'm RB, you don't, call me, don't call me Mr. Bottle. You don't know, please, please, <laughs> that's my dad. Um, <laughs> you know, we are gonna get into distribution and things like that, but here's, here's what I would say to it. I think you're brilliant because in this day and age right now, 
it, it, there's so much dust in the air with the way distribution channels are and it's so competitive right now everybody is making content you know when you could film something on your phone or you could you know and have and edit it on your phone and get it out in the world film something on a weekend and have it out and edit it on a monday so can everybody else so you know the question becomes how do you stand out right and you know, we talked about this last night that the, the competitive nature of this business right now, it's just never been higher. So to me, everything is about controlling as much as you can control. How far can you take what you have? Do you have a project? If you know you have a screenplay, can you go film it? Can you go do it yourself? Can you do a proof of concept if it's you know applicable? And we'll, we're going to talk more about that as we go along. But in this day and age, there's no excuse not to control what you can control as much as you can control. One of the things I'll do sometimes is I'll make a checklist of how does this project get from the script to the screen, right? And if it's a low budget kind of thing, I sit there and I go, well, I can do that. Well, I know somebody, I know a sound engineer. I know, uh, you know, I know, I know a great DP. I know this. How much money do I really need? Do I really need that? And I start going down that list. And when I get to the bottom of it, I sit there and I go, well, maybe I'm not going to go to a traditional channel with this one. Maybe we'll go try to film this on our own. Maybe we'll, you know, get a group together and, and just do it a different way and release it out into the wild and see what happens. These are all things that you guys need to be thinking about. Don't think traditional because traditional really doesn't exist anymore. It really doesn't. Theatrical, you know, uh, everybody wants to be on Netflix and Amazon. Oh, I got a great, I hear this 50 times a week. I got a great project for Netflix and Amazon. Which, by the way, yeah. is ironic because six or seven years ago, nobody, nobody wanted, wanted to be on that. Netflix or Amazon. You know, but but is that realistic? Is there another way to get it out? You know, can you, can you make, you know, now you got Quibi, you know, you got six minute episodes being done, 10 of them, you know, as opposed to a 60 minute pilot, you know? So there's a million options, but you need to be educated on them. You need to be aware of them. You need to know how they work. You need to know how to access them. And you know, and you need to be, I, we talked about this earlier, but you need to be honest with yourself. You need like, what's, everybody has that pie in the sky dream, but you know, maybe you could start here as opposed to starting here. You know, nobody takes one step to the top of the mountain. It takes a million little steps to get to the top of the mountain. All right, guys, we we'll have time for one more question. Hi, good morning. My name is Sonia Dumas. Excuse me, I have a cold, so I sound a little different even to myself. Um, I am a director, writer, producer of many small nano budget, not even micro budget films. And I had a question about genre. I know that uh, diversity is in, but is there a particular genre that is more commercially engaging at this point? Uh, and if there is, what might that be? Well, horror is never out. I mean, and, and it's back in again now with, you know, Get Out and Us and everything like that. I don't know if you guys have any other opinions, on, you know, on, but horror is always, always in. And maybe trying to find a way to do it that's unique and elevated, <laughs> as opposed to doing Friday the 13th, right. you do what Jordan Peele did in Get Out, or even, I think, even more elevated in Us, and maybe a little more garbled, but... Um, but still very interesting, at very least. Interesting. Uh, you know, so I think that's exciting, you know. Um, uh, but that's not everybody's cup of tea. You know, a lot of people don't like horror. Thrillers still uh, hold up pretty well. And now there's actually, oddly enough, a demand after many years of there being a drought for romantic comedies. And you can do a romantic comedy on a nano budget. Hi, my name is Sadness. Nobody important. Um, um, You're important to us. That's right. We love you. Don't we love him? Yes. Okay, so um, you, a uh, curator, you analyze scripts. Yes. And uh, so you read the whole script. Whole thing. Okay. So um, you said earlier that one of the most asked questions is how does a character change? But there's a thing called flat arcs where characters don't necessarily change where as supposed to they change the environment around them. That's correct. So yeah. for and the other characters around them, yes. Yeah. Like movies like right, Night Like Crawler. Forrest Gump, you know, yeah. perhaps, yeah. So how does that necessarily work 
Like, how do you look at that? Like, how do you determine whether it feels good or not, or is it something taboo? It's definitely not taboo. And the, uh, the only thing I can say is that if you can pull it off and the script works, that's all that matters. Uh, but I'll also say that it can be very, very difficult for a writer who doesn't really have a great command of her craft to perhaps have a character that is, um, I don't want to say inactive, but passive perhaps. Um, and uh, because those kinds of scripts can be very, very difficult to write. In fact, actually, probably the majority of the scripts that I read, that I pass on, uh, are scripts that have a uh, passive character or you know inactive character, whether that be by choice or accidentally. Uh, because it can be very difficult to generate the momentum in the script. Uh, usually sort of a flat arc often means uh, a flat script because if we're traveling scripts, the character's journey is like a roller coaster. Um, and if you had a roller coaster that went like this, you might ask for your money back. So I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying that it's really, really, really hard to pull it off and make it successful. Can it be done? Absolutely. Would I recommend it for a new writer? I would not. And one thing I want to piggyback on is what you said before, the idea that you don't put a script down, you know, if there's misspellings or anything like Even that. Even after last night, I skimmed a script, right? And then, you, you know, did. here, but, I'm confessing. I did skim. Yeah. However, though, I had already read an earlier draft, and they were forcing me to come down and socialize. Yes. Yeah, I had no choice. Um, but you know, you're reading for actors. A lot of people. If you're a starting, if you're a writer that's starting out, and you're looking for representation. It it definitely does matter. Your first ten pages matter. Your your misspe- You know, you you ha- your spelling's got to be on point. Everything's got to be on point. And here's really why. If you're re- if you're submitting to a manager, the odds are that manager has people reading for them first, um, looking for things that are spectacular. Again, it takes an hour and a half to two hours to read a script. If they have, you know, 50 scripts, they're going to look at those first 10 pages or look, you know, if you're on page two and there's all these misspellings, they're going to go, nope, new right. They, they don't know what. By the way, I was not in some. I'm not insinuating that Listen. a script should be filled with typos. Listen. But I'm saying if there's a, a typo here and there, everybody's script is going to have a typo. I mean, it's going to happen, right? And the end, let me just say. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm going to dis... Listen, you know, we're going to spice this thing up a little bit. <laughs> That's just why I love being on panels with you, because I just get um, to sit back and just, you know... Uh, you know, uh, I ran the story department at ICM, and, you know, we weren't just looking for scripts for talent. We were looking for scripts for representation and et cetera, et cetera. And my edict was always, first and foremost, we're looking for unique voices. We're looking for great stories. That's first, that should always be first and foremost. Well, I'll tell you, yeah. but that doesn't happen. No, it doesn't happen with a lot of management companies these days. I mean, I'm not kidding, because they get so many submissions that they have, some of them give them a mandate to read the first 10 pages. And if, there's, if it doesn't click or Those it doesn't Those are interns. Go, yeah, but it doesn't get to the manager. They're not even good readers. Never mind. Make sure your script's on point. Trust me. Make sure your script's on point. Uh, listen, I, I would agree with that. But still, keep... Keep your priorities in mind because even an idiot can do a spell check. All right? You know what people can't do well? They can't write good stories. Well, that's what I'm saying. That's they get the to page part. 10 and the story's not singing, they, they might put it away. That happens. Listen, you're in the ivory tower, man. You're not down on the ground, you're up there. <laughs> All right, we'll do one more question, then we're, we need to get to for the next panel. <laughs> Hi, morning. My name is Jamil. I do story editing. Um, so I wanted to know how to, how does one get deeper into that? What is the industry like for it? How do you break into that kind of that kind of thing? Because it is honestly, you yeah. don't anymore. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually a dinosaur. So I'm done. Okay. Yeah. In uh, so many ways. Yeah. Oh. Uh, <laughs> um, it, it's it's. Uh, it's really sort of a dying art. They don't really want to pay people anymore right. to do what I do. I'm actually the only person who does what I do at any agency. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's sort of uh, it's a dying art. So basically, uh, 
you're screwed. Okay. Uh, <laughs> however, though, during the break, let's talk. Okay. Yeah, all right? All right, good. Yeah, I'd like to do that. Lost dreams. Hmm? Lost dreams. I'm telling you, man, I'm, uh, you know. Um, I'm actually going to give some advice on that one. Um, another alternative for you uh, is is maybe to get into um, a development executive role at a production company, because um, you're going to get to do a lot of the the, the things that you that, that Chris does in terms of story editing. But that that's at least a, 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 a that's that's at least a, a definitive path where there are still jobs available that that are definitely needed from production companies. Some of that from okay. You could certainly, by the way, read scripts for contests. So, for example, I'm sure that a contest like Stage 32 needs people to read scripts. And you don't need to, you can be anywhere in the world now to read right. scripts. Yep. Right. Um, the problem is, is that you're not necessarily going to get paid a whole lot of money to do it. So, uh, that's why you and I should talk. All right. Yeah. All right, good. Yeah. Good. All right, great, guys. Um, it, can we have a big round of applause for our panelists here? And you guys, thank you. And I, I think we could all say we're really proud of everybody opening up and talking. I mean, we want to make this a, a conversation so it's helpful. You know, we came here to help. So um, we're going to uh, get set up for the next panel, which is talking about raising money for all of these stories that we just talked about. Mm -hmm.